Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India This is the last lecture on cell signaling pathways and a very short one. In this session, we will be dealing with ionotropic receptors. The approach to studying cell signaling was to classify membrane receptors in four ways. They are listed here. We have considered some details of these three types of receptors in the earlier sessions. And in this session, we are going to look at ionotropic receptors. Ionotropic receptors are called thus because the receptor itself is an ion channel. The channel would normally be closed and when the ligand binds to that receptor come channel, the channel will open up. The common ligands which have ionotropic receptors are listed here, acetylcholine, glutamate, glycine and GABA. We have considered ionotropic receptors in a different context earlier, Dr. Vinay Oman called them ligand gated channels. They are found here in the table that Vinay has shown you earlier. Of all these channels, these are the ones that we are referring to as ionotropic receptors. Why not this? We will see why this one is different from the rest shortly. While these are ion channels which open up when the ligand binds to them directly, this channel does not bind the ligand. The ligand binds to a different receptor and by an indirect mechanism opens up that channel, which is why it is not listed as an ionotropic receptor. So these ligands appear here in the table. Acetylcholine is the ligand for nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, glutamate is the ligand for non-NMDA and NMDA sensitive receptors. Both of these are glutamate receptors, the natural ligand is glutamate and NMDA is a blocker for this type of receptor, NMDA stands for N-methyl diaspartate. The other receptors which bind glutamate and are ionotropic receptors are called non-NMDA receptors. Amper receptor is just one of them. There is another one called kinate receptor. You can read about that yourself. We are just dealing with amper receptors here. Let us first look at the acetylcholine receptor, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor and along with that we will consider the potassium channel which is gated by acetylcholine, the KACH channel. The nicotinic acetylcholine receptor is located on the membrane of skeletal muscles at the motor end plate where the nerve enters and communicates with the muscle, the neuromuscular junction. That is the region. The muscle membrane in that region is where the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are located. Acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter released by the motor nerve onto the muscle cell membrane. Then it binds to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. That receptor itself is a channel it opens up, permitting ion movement. You notice that it is a non-specific monovalent cation channel which permits both sodium and potassium to go across. We will come back to that shortly. Now we will look at the KACH channel. This channel is normally closed. The best location to study them is on the membrane of the pacemaker, the sinoatrial node. The pacemaker is innervated by the vagus nerve and the vagus nerve releases acetylcholine. Acetylcholine does not directly bind to the KACH channel, instead it binds to what are called muscarinic receptors on the pacemaker cell. The muscarinic receptors are actually G protein coupled receptors. We know about G protein coupled receptors. Therefore. They activate a G protein which in turn opens the 
KACH channel. To add on a level of detail, normally the G, in the G proteins, it is the alpha subunit which will dissociate, move and activate an enzyme. That is what we have seen in earlier contexts. But here, the beta gamma subunits move to open the KACH channel. Looking back at GPCRs, when we considered G protein coupled receptors, we did not talk about the KACH channel. That was just to keep things simple. We spoke about four types of G proteins acting on four different types of membrane enzymes. They were all enzymes. We kept them together. But now, yes, here is a G protein which is not acting on an enzyme but is opening an ion channel directly. That is the KACH channel. This being a potassium channel, opening of that channel will hyperpolarize the membrane. Therefore, it is more difficult for the sinoatrial nodal cell to depolarize and develop an action potential because the membrane potential is very negative. That is one of the ways in which the vagus nerve by releasing acetylcholine reduces the heart rate. The muscarinic receptors in the pacemaker cell and in the heart are the ones which are coupled to KACH channels. They are the inhibitory ones. But you will find muscarinic receptors which are metabotropic receptors in other smooth muscles, bronchial smooth muscle, gut smooth muscle, etc., which are actually stimulatory. They are not coupled to KACH channels. I have a problem putting this muscarinic receptor into any one class. I would like to think of membrane receptors as either ionotropic or metabotropic. Metabotropic receptors would induce an enzyme which would create some reactions within the cell. And ionotropic receptors are those where the ligand will open an ion channel. This is a kind of in between. I do not know whether we should call this type of muscarinic receptor a, mus, uh, a metabotropic receptor. What about the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor? We already saw that it is a non-specific monovalent cation channel which permits both sodium and potassium to move in opposite directions. The equilibrium potential for such non-specific cation channels, be it non-specific monovalent cation or non-specific cation channels which also permit the divalent cation calcium to go through, whichever non-specific cation channel, if those are the only channels which are open in the membrane at a given time, then the membrane potential will reach 0 millivolts because there's current in both directions. If the membrane potential is moving towards 0 millivolts, that is depolarization of the membrane. Let us see what happens in the muscle cell membrane. If that is the nerve and that is the skeletal muscle, this is the neuromuscular junction. Acetylcholine is released into the cleft. It binds to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors and the channel within that receptor opens up. It is a nonspecific monovalent cation channel and that will take the membrane to 0 millivolts. So, if that is the resting membrane potential of the muscle cell, when the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors open up, the muscle membrane will attempt to move towards 0 millivolts or will attempt to depolarize. However, when the membrane potential reaches minus 55 millivolts, Dr. Vinay has told you that that is the threshold for opening voltage gated sodium channels. There are voltage gated sodium channels on the muscle cell membrane. They will open and take the membrane towards the sodium equilibrium potential which is a positive potential. So, rather than the membrane reaching 0 millivolts, what you will see when nicotinic acetylcholine receptors open up is an action potential. So, this is the skeletal muscle action potential. And the initial or early depolarization is brought about by the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. This early depolarization may be called an end plate potential. Myasthenia gravis, which is a disorder causing weakness of muscles, is an autoimmune disorder specifically targeting the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors.
Now let us move on to the glutamate receptors, NMDA and non-NMDA glutamate receptors. We are going to look at only one non-NMDA glutamate receptor, the AMPA receptor. AMPA is a blocker for that receptor. NMDA receptors are called thus because N-methyl D-aspartate is a blocker for this type of glutamate receptor. While this one is a non-specific monovalent cation channel like the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, the NMDA sensitive glutamate receptors are non-specific cation channels which also permit the divalent cation calcium to go through. Both these types of glutamate receptors are located in synapses on the membrane of the postsynaptic neuron. Most excitatory synapses in the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord, release glutamate as the neurotransmitter. Glutamate will first bind to the AMPA type of glutamate receptors on the postsynaptic neuron and that is responsible for the initial depolarization because these are also non-specific monovalent cation channels. They like the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor will attempt to depolarize the membrane but since the postsynaptic cell has voltage gated sodium channels after this initial period of depolarization up to the threshold for opening voltage gated sodium channels what you will indeed see is an action potential. The foot of the action potential in the postsynaptic cell is called an EPSP, an excitatory postsynaptic potential. And the AMPA type of glutamate receptors are responsible for the EPSPs in a postsynaptic neuron. NMDA type of glutamate receptors are also found on postsynaptic neurons. They have some special properties since they also allow calcium to go through. Dr. Anand Bhaskar will consider them again when he discusses calcium transporters in general. He will speak about the properties of the NMDA receptors there. But I would like to highlight some things about the NMDA receptors here. They have a number of important roles in neurological function. One well studied role is in associative learning. When you study neurology, you will see that learning and memory is classified into associative learning, non-associative learning, etc. A good example of associative learning is what you already know, classical conditioning, Pavlov's experiment where there is a dog a bell rings and then food is presented to the dog every time the bell rings. If this pairing has occurred a few times, the dog will of course salivate when food is given. But if you pair presenting the food to ringing of the bell a few times, then just ringing the bell will cause salivation because the animal is now associating ringing of the bell with presentation of food. That is a good example of associative learning and that kind of associative learning requires NMDA receptors. Not all learning, they say non-associative learning is not affected when you block NMDA receptors with NMDA in simple experimental systems. Whereas blockade of NMDA receptors with NMDA will block associative learning. So these experimental systems in which you can study learning can be as simple as a pre and postsynaptic neuron where you introduce electrodes and measure potentials. Or there could be whole, whole animals like the dog. Or there could be brain preparations where you stimulate one region and study what happens at another region. Has learning occurred or not? NMDA receptors are also implicated in this important phenomenon called excitotoxicity. That is, if a neuron is repeatedly excited and if it has NMDA receptors, there would be calcium entry and that will cause damage within the cell. These kind of repeated excitations occur, for example, during epilepsy. In the post-epileptic state, there could be neuronal injury, continuing neuronal injury because of increased calcium within the postsynaptic neuron due to opening up of NMDA receptors.
during repeated excitations, glutamate is released. And if the NMDA receptors open up, increasing calcium within the postsynaptic cell, then that can injure the nerve cell. So the question is, can you use an NMDA receptor blocker in the immediate post-epileptic period to prevent such neuronal injury? Is there success with such attempts? You can consider that question. Another example of excitotoxicity is what is called ischemia reperfusion injury. Ischemia is a state where there is reduced blood supply to the brain and subsequently when there is reperfusion, NMDA receptors may be overactive and cause toxicity. A third condition where NMDA receptors are implicated is what's called wind up pain. When you have an injury, there would be pain in that region, but sometimes you get hyperalgesia, you get enhanced pain not only in the region of injury, but also around that region, what's called wind up pain. The phenomenon responsible for this is activation of NMDA receptors in the spinal cord. And finally, a blocker of NMDA receptors which is successfully used in therapeutics to treat pain or sometimes to induce analgesia even during surgeries is ketamine. It's a blocker of NMDA receptors. Not only this, NMDA receptors are extensively studied and are implicated in a number of neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's disease, Huntington's chorea, even Parkinsonism and even schizophrenia. But attempts to develop treatment strategies for these diseases using some kind of NMDA receptor blockade have not been very successful. We will now consider GABA and glycine receptors. GABA and glycine are also neurotransmitters released by a presynaptic neuron onto a postsynaptic neuron. Both these GABA and glycine receptors are chloride channels. GABA and glycine are released by the presynaptic neuron. You could have GABAergic neurons or glycinergic neurons and they bind to their respective receptors on the postsynaptic neuronal membrane opening the channels within those receptors. Those channels are chloride channels and you know that when chloride channels open, the cell will hyperpolarize. So, if that is the resting potential of the postsynaptic neuron, if a presynaptic neuron releases either GABA or glycine and opens up the chloride channels in their respective receptors, the membrane will hyperpolarize, become more negative. These hyperpolarizations induced by these neurotransmitters are called inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. They are inhibitory because, now suppose there is another synapse here also acting on this postsynaptic neuron and that releases glutamate. Normally, that amount of depolarization would have induced an action potential in the postsynaptic neuron. But since either of these neurotransmitters has induced a hyperpolarization in the postsynaptic neuron, you would need additional depolarization to strike an action potential in the postsynaptic neuron. In that sense, they are inhibitory neurotransmitters. GABA is the inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain, gamma aminobutyric acid, and glycine is the inhibitory neurotransmitter in the spinal cord. That was a very short session. Thank you.